the Morkamantum. You must be one of the <laughs> few people who know the words and the tune of the Morkamantum. Uh, will you believe? For. Now, I know I'm 83 in a fortnight. So, you know, not a lot of people won't have lived with the age, but the people who were my age group that year, we used to have a carnival here, you see. Well, this was one year. I used to say to everybody when I came back, you remember, dear old Morka? No. Folks don't die, and that's the reason why Morecambe to Morecambe is clever than I am. And nobody knew it. Morecambe to Morecambe by the sea. We made a South Bank show on Thora Heard in 1994. And I thought at the time, I wish we could stay a week and film her every day, just talking about her life. She had such a memory, so detailed, and so full of social history, if you want to put it that way. Just talking about the people in Morecambe, the street in Morecambe, scrubbing the steps in Morecambe, what people did how the theatre was, what the music was like, what the front was like at the front in Morecambe itself. I was rather attached to that because I had two or three holidays with my mother in Morecambe. Morecambe was then, well, it was off the radar, really. It was unbelievably wonderful. But Thora Heard had it all, and she had what... It's difficult to talk about these things without being a bit daft, but she had what I think could be fairly called a Lancastrian sense of humour. And she was so funny. I'm very proud of being a Lancastrian because there's no doubt as a county, and I'm going to get shot for this, they are funny people. We got an errand boy at the court when I worked there, Willie Taylor. These assistants were all comics. They were all stand-up comics and they're all right. <laughs> Great, the cop. So he says, what shall I do first, Mr Rose? That was the manager. And he says, oh, ask, ask Mr Armrod. Well, at one of the comics, and he said, you know Edgar Bell's, the hardware shop up at Queen Street? He said, of course I do. He says, well, will you go in for a large tin <laughs> of frog's knee paste? Frog's knee paste, you see, and he said, frog's knee paste, because the lad didn't really <laughs> He goes up, and I said to George, oh, Rod, you rotten egg. Oh, he said he'd got to learn to be one of us, to be much worse than that. Comes back about after ten minutes. He says, Mr. Bell says, I have to tell you sorry, he's only small ones. Should I have brought one? And he said, No, get on. If my father had been alive, I'd have it been a wedding at all. In a kind of loving, you're a sort of you're a Well, um, that film. Mm. I'm kidding, not kidding you, Melvin. You'd have thought I'd never been in anything in my life till that. And I never thought it was such a big part. I thought the importance of the film was the first film John Schlesinger had directed, apart from a little railway one he'd done that was very good. Terminus, yeah. And every time they show that where he's being sick over the furniture. <coughs> you filthy pig. I mean, I can just imagine <coughs> me Auntie Nelly. Me Auntie Nelly would have shot him. <laughs> but you saw the disgust of this woman, you see. I think the first time I was conscious of her was um, in A Kind of Loving, where she played the mother of the, uh, the matchless Ingrid, who Alan Bates took a fancy to. There's a wonderful scene where Alan Bates uh, bring, uh, comes home with Ingrid and, uh, and he's drunk, uh, and, uh, and he's in uh, Thora's... Uh, immaculate drawing room and then he's sick over the back of the settee and um, and I, I, it's a funny scene in itself but it's also funny because I think John Schlesinger who was a director uh, asked Thora to improvise and of course she never improvised in her life <laughs> she, she was uh, that was a very good thing about her she was always actually riveted to the words and she knew the words uh, always perfectly but anyway yeah, uh, she he, she had to say something like, uh, "Oh, you're disgusting! You, you're absolutely disgusting!" Uh, and but he then let the camera roll, and she had to uh, sort of embroider, "You're absolutely disgusting!" In, and and uh, and it's a fun, very funny scene to watch, particularly if you know that she's desperately trying to think of something extra to say. You filthy pig! You filthy disgusting! Disgusting pig. 
It was then, really, that she started to be taken more seriously, I think, as an actress, really. How did you get on with your mother? You speak extraordinarily warmly of her all the time in the book. Well, and, uh, so just a little speak. of her. People came to my mother for everything. This was an actress, a good Christian. <coughs> all day, this is all day, when our front door was opened at half past seven in the morning. Imagine it in these days of the trouble and everything. <coughs> You there, Mrs. Heard? What is it, Isaac? Because we've all these names in the street. Well, my, my mother says, could you just lend the two candles? We were like a, a shop. My father said, you'll drop dead doing for people, won't you? She said, I hope so. Did you ever see her unhappy in any way? Or was she always... See she my mother unhappy. She sounds very contented and, uh, and in the, from the book extremely... Well, she was, she was. She was a Morecambe girl, you see, and my granddad was a fisherman. And when we say a trawler, I mean, it sort of was a boat with a sail, not with a, not even with an engine for boiling the shrimps, which they do. I can't find out. Do they still catch shrimps at Morecambe, do you know? Yes, a bit they do, now, yeah. But in those days, of course, they brought them off and boiled them in the backyard in a thing, because they're grey, as you know. Mm. Or am I teaching you something, Mr. Bragg? You don't grey shrimps and boil them till they're pink, you see. What about your father? Was he very strict with you? I remember. When Nev was about 13 or 14, he went to Stories Institute in Lancaster School. He's got the white flannels on for the cricket outfit, the maroon cap. He's coming down the pier. My headmistress always used to correct me, Thora, the pier does not go up and come down on the pier or off the pier. Corrected every day with that one. And um, he's coming down the pier with Wally Gosling, his friend, lovely name, that for the Bills, Wally Gosling. With the fag, you know. <laughs> My father's coming over the pier and sees him. Just as he passes, he said, you enjoying that cigarette? Now, if my father said it like that, you just might as well give in, because you were going to cop it if it was the next week. He wouldn't forget. When he came into his tea, he said to Nev, was that supposed to be clever, then? He said, well, I'm sorry, Dad. He said, sorry, nothing. I'll just tell you this. He said, if I catch you smoking again, I will make you eat it. So remember that. Oh, Jim, my mother said, going into some part or other, you see. Oh, Jim. Well, I suppose it would be three weeks after. But my father is coming down Cheapside, where we live, and Nev's going up it. And my father just touched his sword and said, go back. So I came back and he stood in the kitchen and they were looking very cheap and said, he said, eat that. Oh, Jim, he said, make him ill, says my mother, you know. He says, I don't care if it kills him. I've warned him, eat it. Well, I'm going to see my brother now, putting that fag end and standing, <laughs> chewing it. He didn't say chew him, he said, eat that. And I could see it was going to be stick. I was interviewing in the Winter Gardens, this magnificent place in Morecambe, which used to hold, I think, 3,000 people. Everybody played there, all the great ones of the early 50s. And it was derelict. And we had two little chairs at the front, a camera there, a camera there. And she talked away and conjured up what that place had been. And it was very, very difficult to stop laughing and being moved at the same time. She could, she could do both. Another little bit of glorious Morecambe over there, the Winter Gardens. When you were in Rep, George Formby was in the audience, then a colossal star in this country, mm. anyway. And he and his wife came round and said that they wanted to take you for a screen test. There's me with my 50 shilling tailor spin stripe suit on. Uh, not as good as that, but that pattern. <laughs> and um, my Auntie Molly's fox fur here and my Auntie Martha's fox fur. I look like Bud Flanagan, you know, <laughs> five feet with two furs hanging. They bring me on, make me up. It was Basil Dearden, God rest him, who was going to direct Will Hay in Black Sheep of Whitehall, his first, his first film, not Will's. And he comes off the hand, it's a great, great, marvellous mark. Ten times I've done it. Now this time, this time he said, he'll say, where will you go, Lydia? And I want you to, I shall go to London and bugger you. He said, you know the sort of thing. And he said, where will you go, Lydia? And I said, I shall go to London and bugger you, and bugger you. And I started it politely. I said, that's 11 times I've done this. 
if I haven't done it right now, you're only being polite. Look, I said, I didn't ask to come here. I was in rep, very happy, and I do all this. And somebody said, cut, and I didn't know what that meant. They said, the, the rush is here to 10 o'clock in the morning. Rush is here? What's a rush is here to? And I s sat there, and I saw Miss Al say, I shall go to London and buggy you, and buggy you, because I never asked to come here. You've asked me, and I'm spilling it off till the cut. And that's what got me a concert. <laughs> Can you believe? I felt a bit different coming back, you see. And the furs, don't forget the furs, because furs. when I asked for a cup of tea... In, Through the window? Uh, yes, I think it was... Where would it be? Crew, you Crew, said. Crew, that's right. right. Threatens the tea. And I handed the money, and the furs slithered off and landed it. And so they were copulating on the, on the platform. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on quite a bit to when you were established and there were these great Blackpool seasons which were, I mean, I used to go in the 50s with my father and all of this Blackpool and they were magnificent shows, boats on the stage. And... 14 live shows. Every actress should do twice nightly at Blackpool for a season because if it's a three-act play, when you've done two, you think, oh, I have another to do. No, I haven't have another four. You played the part of the mother in a play called Flowers for the Living in a, in a small but very um, prestigious theatre in London. Why was that part important for you? Why do you look back at it, as, you, as I know you do, and think this mm -hmm. is an important part for me? Well, because my father, he saw that. And in the second act, I got around like you never, on a crying and out. And when we got home at night, he said to me, it was a hell of a round you got, wasn't it, in act two? I said, yes, wasn't it? Now, I shouldn't have said it like that, you see. And he said, quite wrong, of course, quite wrong. Because, bear in mind, my family, none of them, including that dear gentleman I tell I love every night of my life, have never said, oh, you were best. But they've never done, never did anything like that, my family, to get a very good out of them. But I knew that if I'd been rotten, they would have said, give it up. Anyway, anyway, my dad's sitting there at home. He mentions everybody in the play, and perfectly. Oh, that boy, he said, who played the... Good. Now, that was a beautiful cameo. It goes all through. And I realised, you know, he's never mentioned me. He'd wanted to come to the first night, and I said, please, Dad, don't come to the first night. Give me till Wednesday to play it as I think you might, which he did. I was always sorry I never had him on that first night, but never mind. Anyway, so he sees it on the Wednesday, he sees it again on the Friday, and we're now speaking of the Friday. But he said to me on the Wednesday about the exit, he said, do you know if you were very clever, you would go out to a church, a church. I said, yes, but I've just said, never mind what you just said. You mean to total silence? Oh, yeah. that's what he meant, yes. Yeah. He said, that would be perfection. And they were applauding you going out after a big emotional well, scene. Well, it was because it, I, the line I even remember now was, when Lil comes back to the boy who she was going to marry, and then she tries to kill him or she says, she won't go back, will she? <laughs> and she creeps out, you see, so, and he says, very nice, lovely that, in the middle of a scene. Well, of course, the first night I went off to... And then two or three more, but nothing, nothing. Just embarrassment, really. That's the Thursday night after he's seen it, on the Wednesday, you see, with Dad. So he's coming in on the Friday. And I would like to say that I went off to dead silence, but I didn't. But I just went off to somebody starting to stop in. Well, Dad. Very good. And he gets to the door, but being an actor, he always had to make a King Lear exit, you know what I mean? He gets to the door and he said, you're a wonderful actress. I've lived to see you play like this, and went. But me, being a bit embarrassed, he said it. I said, could you give me that in writing? Right. In a little while, 10 minutes after I go, and I took him the blanket under him in bed, because he's turned this way and it's off his back. And I kissed him, good night, God bless. He was dead the next morning. Now, suppose he'd never said that to me. Man never said in the business. 
This altered my life because it was like a Bennett nearly. The first thing she did of mine was a play called uh, Me, I'm Afraid of Virginia Woolf, which Stephen Frears directed. Um, and uh, she played, uh, um, um, you know, another mother, really, another uh, comic mother. She was um, trying to uh, suss out her son's uh, sex life, really, and uh, which he wasn't happy with anyway, and uh, was reluctant to tell her about. Friends, doing things together. Doing what together? Having tea in Marshall and Snell Groves. Having tea in Marshall and Snell Groves isn't lesbianism. It's only liking being with other women. Not in Marshall and Snell Groves. Well, where then? Ben, you brought the subject up. Well, so, anyway, I've been in bed with other women. Who? Your Auntie Phyllis, for a start. Auntie Phyllis isn't women. Besides, when were you in bed with Auntie Phyllis? During the air raids. Supposing the same words had been in another shape, and, and she said, well, that isn't, that doesn't mean she's a lesbian. Your Auntie Mary and I often had to sleep together during the air raids. L nothing. But a quick reply, well, that's nothing. I slept with your Auntie Phyllis all during the air raids. It, it is funnier to think of it like this. The first monologue I wrote for her was uh, Cream Cracker Under the Settee about a woman who, uh, uh, living on her own, has a fall and, and, uh, and really you realise that she is going to die because nobody else can uh, knows that she's had a fall and she's lying there. Uh, uh, and you also realise that this woman, um, although she's in this uh, moving position, um, isn't really a very nice woman, uh, and uh, uh, and, as, and is over house proud, and you could see that she, uh, being over house proud, has probably killed her husband in a way, um, and uh, she could see this, Thora, and she took me aside uh, when we were rehearsing and said. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll do it exactly as you want me to do it, but uh, is there no way I can uh, suggest that uh, just at some point in my life I was I was a nice person, and uh, and can you not just write in a few lines to that effect? Uh, and I said I'd try, though I, I I didn't want to do, and I didn't actually try. I, I, and she did it exactly as as as. Uh, as, you know, one wanted her to do it. I'm going to save that cream cracker. And I'm going to show it to her next time she starts on at me about Stafford House. I'll say, don't Stafford House me, lady. This cream cracker was under the settee. And I've only got to send this cream cracker to the director of social services and you will be on the carpet. Same as this cream cracker. <laughs> About 17 years ago, you started what became, in a way, another career, which was a career as a, as a religious broadcaster. How did that come about, and uh, why did you want to do it? Well, very simply, and I didn't know I wanted to do it, the BBC asked me to present this programme, Praise Be. How did they know you were religious? I mean, what was They didn't religion? know. Hello. What a lovely welcome back to our new series. The rousing chorus from To God Be the Glory, played by the International Staff Band of the Salvation Army. And we've got a new title this year too. Did you notice? Praise Be. This is true, Melvin. I've said a lot of prayers in my life I had no right to say, if I'd thought first. You see, my mother, the first heart attack, I was in, at the co-op, and in those days, they used to run to work where you'll take and you come home a minute, your mother's ill. And nobody said, no, you can't go. Go on, love, and see what it is. And I went home, and my mother had had the heart attack, and the doctor was there. And as soon as I knew that the heart attack was over and everything, I went up to my bedroom. Well, I mean, you can pray anywhere. You can pray in Sainsbury's. I pray anywhere. But I went upstairs, went on my knees, and I begged of God to spare her so we could show her how much we loved her by looking after her. Yes, loving. You see, I shouldn't have done that for eight years in agony. 
But you, you see, I shouldn't be emotional like this, all the one in the right setting, aren't we? And a lot of prayers I should never have said, because you're a bit inclined, aren't you, when your faith is, and mine is, you know, the leading man up there. You're a bit inclined to think, well, I've only to ask, you know. Of course we don't. I should have more sense at my age. What I like to remember is her memorial service at Westminster Abbey, no less. And she was very fond of the Salvation Army. Now, the Salvation Army and Westminster Abbey isn't the world's most natural mix. Um, but I have reasons to be very fond of the Salvation Army. And we were all in this memorial service, and the great west doors were flung open, and a full Salvation Army band came right down the nave with the tambourines and the drums and the flags. It was great. Isn't it great? Aren't we lucky? Aren't you nice? <laughs> I love you.